everyone. My name is Iris Chu, and I'm director of the Center for Ethics and Law at UCL. Uh, together with the Center for Criminal Law at UCL, we are very pleased to bring you this event on justice for sub masters in the, in the recent cases. Um, this event will discuss the recent quashing of um, many sub masters convictions, lessons that were learned, and many more unresolved issues going forward. We have today assembled a large panel to tease out various issues, and we regard this as the beginning of a platform for discussion not that a comprehensive slate of answers will necessarily be arrived at. But there is a benefit to having a breadth of discussion of various issues from criminal law to corporate governance. And hopefully this event will bring us um, a lot of inspiration for projects going forward uh, for engagement in depth. So I'll briefly talk about the running order uh, of our event today um, and make a brief introduction of each of our panelists. So we have a large panel today and kicking off the event uh, will be Ian Henderson of Second Sight. Uh, Ian was part of the team that conducted a private investigation into the post office um, Horizon IT system between 2012 to 2015. Uh, Ian will set the scene. Uh, following uh, from Ian, we'll have um, the practitioners who worked on the cases securing the quashing of convictions. And uh, we have a solicitor partner of Aria Grace Law, uh, Nick Gould. He will take the floor first. Uh, and following that, Flora Page from 23 Essex Chambers and Paul Marshall from Cornerstone Barristers. Following from that, uh, we'll have comments from um, our criminal law experts, uh, Anthony Edwards, a retired solicitor with an extensive criminal law experience, and Jonathan Rogers from the University of Cambridge. And after that, we'll have comments regarding corporate responsibility, culture, uh, and senior management responsibility. And the comments will be provided by Dr. Ellen Brainer of UCL uh, and uh, Dinesh, uh, Dineshi Ramesh of Board Intelligence. And finally, Professor Richard Moorhead of the University of Exeter will talk about legal, professional ethics, privilege, and some of these issues that we are really concerned about regarding the role of lawyers and business ethics in general. So without further ado, we'll kick off the event uh, with Ian. Uh, can I invite Ian to the floor, please? Iris, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to provide some background to these appalling miscarriages of justice. As uh, Iris has said, uh, I'm a director of Second Sight, the forensic accountancy firm appointed in 2012 to conduct an independent investigation into matters of concern relating to the Horizon IT system. I'm qualified both as a chartered accountant and as an IT lawyer, uh, auditor. Second Sight was appointed by a small group of members of parliament at the request of the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance, the JFSA. Our professional fees were paid directly by post office who also supported our appointment. JFSA had been pressing for some form of independent inquiry for many years and had gained the support of influential MPs representing constituents who had suffered mysterious shortfalls in branch accounts. Our appointment was not straightforward. There was much suspicion that we would be a poodle for post office or otherwise fail to approach the inquiry from a fiercely independent professional point of view. Our terms of appointment were quite clear. They included, firstly, unrestricted access to documents held by post office, including documents subject to confidentiality and legal professional privilege. And secondly, no limitation in the scope of work determined necessary by us uh, as the uh, lead investigators. In the course of our work over more than three years, we investigated approximately 140 individual cases. We reviewed the sub postmaster's own assertions, the cases put forward on their behalf by their professional advisors, together with post officers' reports prepared in response. We examined thousands of documents and established which were significant. We created a structured evidential database of over 34,000 individual documents. We identified 19 somatic issues that, that were common features to many of the cases under examination. 
we were then able to cross-reference each case to others having similar characteristics. Our work started in the summer of 2012. Initially, post office were cooperative and appeared committed to the agreed goal to seek the truth, irrespective of the consequences. However, within a few days of our appointment, we asked for two actions to be taken. Firstly, for post office to issue a wide litigation hold that would prevent any further documents being destroyed. And secondly, we insisted that all of the prosecution files then held by post office should be sent to a third party scanning bureau. This ensured that those vital documents would be preserved and made more readily available. This bundle of documents comprised over 4,000 individual documents and became known as CD1. In September 2012, I met with Gareth Jenkins, the lead engineer for Horizon at the head office of Fujitsu in Bracknell. I was told that approximately 10 members of staff from post office were permanently based in Bracknell, dealing with various issues, including bugs, errors and defects. I was also told that Fujitsu routinely used remote access technology to access branch terminals for various purposes without the knowledge or specific consent of individual sub postmasters. Within days of being provided with CD1, we realized that we may be looking at a significant number of miscarriages of justice. There was a lack of effective investigation. There were multiple failures of disclosure and there was clearly conduct by prosecutors that needed to be considered by experts in criminal law and prosecutions. At about this time, the attitude of post office changed. Requests for further documents and explanations were taking longer and longer to be provided. By this stage, we were supporting the complete and mediation scheme set up by post office and chaired by Sir Anthony Hooper, a retired Court of Appeal judge. We were getting increasing amounts of pushback from post office. And just to illustrate that, let's look briefly at a clip from the 2015 Select Committee hearing. For example, had gone to trial, but we felt it is necessary for us to review the internal legal files, looking, for example, at the depth of any investigation that has, has happened, Absolutely. possibly even you know, legal advice you know, relating to the prosecution. Paula, why don't you give those files over? What's the um, problem? So I, I think the, the point I want to pick up first, if I may. So just to answer, no, answer my question first, why won't you give Ian Henson those files? We why? Have, as far as I'm aware, Mr. Sahabi, we have shared whatever information is appropriate on every That's single That's not what Ian Henson said. It is the first time personally I have heard that. <coughs> I'm very happy to go away and have a look. Second sight. He has evidence saying that under no circumstances he'd be given those files. That's what you just told me. Is that right? We have not been given those files. You've been told by. Angela, I don't know. organisation, under no circumstances, you begin those files. Is that right or wrong? We've told you that, Ian? It came up at one of the working group meetings which you and I were, were, were present at. Ian is Well, this sounds like a shambles to me. You, you came in here and opened by saying the system is working beautifully. You now realise why you're in front of the committee, is that right? The system, the reason, Ian said he is quite right. The reason we set up this mediation scheme is to get to the truth about the system. The system itself is you working very well. Because what we're hearing from Ian is that your organisation has been obstructive to his independent work. Is that right or wrong? It's wrong. We have provided for every single case detailed, thorough, independent investigation. They run to pages and pages of reports. There are on average but, eight right, pieces of evidence. But we've just heard it. from... We've just heard from Ian Henderson, who is independent and looking for this, that you have not provided the prosecution files that they think they should look at, your files, not just what's publicly available, they need that information. Will you provide it? Yes or no? Mr Zahawi, you have just heard it's the first time I have heard that. Please I'm just asking a commitment from you. You're, you're the head of the organisation. Will you provide it? Yes or no? Simple answer. Mr Henderson is a forensic accountant. He is not a legally qualified individual. Neither I'm just asking I'm you, will you provide yes or no? I'm not prepared on behalf of the post right. office. I've got my answer, give, so you won't. No, you that. haven't got your answer. You haven't heard a yes or no. I'm simply saying that at the moment I'm not able to answer your question. Why? What, 
Because I do not know the details of the situation. Well, you used to provide the, the information. You stopped providing it. Would you provide it going forward? Yes or no? I'm not aware what we have provided previously that we stopped. It's the, Angela has been involved daily for the last two years on this. She sits right. on the working group alongside Ian and Second right. If there is a misunderstanding... Angela, will you I'm provide... If, if, if your CEO can answer, answer, will you answer my question? Will you provide the prosecution files as requested by Ian Henderson, yes or no? As, as Ian said, we have previously provided them and we have provided... In this response, Post Office does not appear to understand the role of an investigator, which is to establish the facts, ask probing questions, and to communicate concerns identified to the appropriate people. You do not have to be legally qualified in order to do that. At the request of the Parliamentary Select Committee, I provided further uh, evidence justifying our need for access to the full prosecution files. In February 2015, I wrote to the committee and said, firstly, the prosecution knew that there was sufficient evidence to support a charge of theft, but proceeded with it nonetheless. These were all points in relation to a single case file that we did manage to get access to. Secondly, the offer by the prosecution to remove the charge of theft was used to put pressure on the defendant to plead guilty to the false accounting charges and to make good the alleged losses. Thirdly, the threat of proceeding with the charge of theft was primarily to assist in the recovery of losses and not in the interest of justice. And falsely, the prosecution insisted that as part of the agreement to drop the charge of theft, that no mention of the alleged problems with the Horizon computer system would be made. Now, those new facts came to light as a result of examining a single complete legal file. And in my view, they identified a number of in issues that indicated, firstly, possible misconduct by a prosecutor on behalf of post office, and secondly, a possible miscarriage of justice. The analysis of a single complete legal file demonstrated the benefit of doing so, particularly bearing in mind the stated objective of post office to solely investigate possible miscarriages of justice. That was all put in a letter to the select committee uh, in 2015. However, little did I know at that time that the defendant referenced but anonymized in this sample case would subsequently become the lead appellant in the 23rd of April hearing by the Court of Appeal, which resulted in 39 criminal convictions being overturned. I'd like to close with a few words attributed possibly wrongly to Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Second Sight went as far as it could within the constraints of our non-disclosure agreement to publicise our findings and our concerns. We said very publicly that we were concerned about the possibility of misconduct by prosecutors and the miscarriages of justice. It is disappointing that it took almost nine years from when we first started work for these gross miscarriages of justice to be properly addressed. There is much more that needs to be done and many questions that still need to be answered. For example, was prosecution policy within post office and Royal Mail influenced by a desire to maximize value prior to an eventual sale or mutualization proposal? Did post office continue to destroy documents even after the litigation hold instruction was issued in 2012? Why were key, key documents such as the clerk advices and the Detica report not disclosed to second sight by post office? When were these critical documents disclosed to the board of post office? Why did no one take action in 2013? when Second Sight first raised many of our concerns in the interim report that was published by Post Office? Why was the Select Committee not more effective in following through on their excellent work in 2015? Was the failed ICL stroke pathway project, Horizon's predecessor system in 1998, a contributing factor to the bugs, errors and defects now identified? Did the Board of Post Office approve the disastrous litigation strategy, including the recusal application in the group lit litigation order, the GLO trial? Did the two government nominated directors on the Board of Post Office support or approve 
the approximately 130 million pounds of legal costs incurred by post office in the GLO trial. Was this regarded as value for money? Finally, was there a cover up within post office and or government of the disastrous decision making within post office? I trust that these questions will be addressed in the statutory inquiry by Sir Wynne Williams, which is now underway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian, for many of your thought provoking uh, questions. Shall I now call upon Nick uh, to take the floor first for the practitioners who worked on the quashing of the convictions? Thank you, Iris. Um, so I'm, I'm Nick Gould. I'm a partner at Aria Grace Law. And I've titled my very brief speech, uh, Law, Liars, Law Lawyers, Life and Death. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly about some of the human aspects of the post office scandal. Um, and perhaps it's because during my years in practice, I've always been a common sense corporate deal doing lawyer that I found trying to help my clients, Janet Skinner, Tracy Felstead and Seema Misra over the last 15 months or so, particularly distressing. From when I first heard about this miscarriage of justice, I've been disgusted to learn how they and hundreds of others were treated by a dismissive and contemptuous legal system over some two decades. No common sense allowed here. I wanted to try and help these extraordinary people whose lives were destroyed unnecessarily and who are still suffering both physical and mental scars some decades later. And yes, I know this is not normally what lawyers talk about or what those involved in learning or teaching law necessarily want to hear. But hear it more lawyers should. It appears that almost the entire legal world has been stunningly silent on this and found wanting, and I think it still is. Why is that? I have a fairly clear idea, but ask me later on. Paul Marshall, Flora Page and I decided to work on a pro bono basis. We wanted our clients to know they had a team which would support and fight for them, come what may. And in truth, it worked both ways. The trust and support which they gave us, incredible really, after what they'd each gone through, enables me to make this next crucial point. It's unquestionably the case that the Court of Appeal would not have been invited by any other applicants or appellants or their counsel to hear and determine crucial arguments on second category, abuse of process, which I think Flora will mention later. Our work was encouraged and supported throughout by our clients, despite many people telling them and us not to do so. This argument affected radically the outcome of the appeals and will change the course of the claims for compensation against the post office for hundreds of other people and will make waves for a while yet. There are two quotes I want to mention, which I think encapsulate what I'm saying. The first is from a debate in parliament in March, 2020. Innocent people jailed, individuals having their good names and livelihoods taken away from them, the full use of the state and its finances to persecute individuals, those are all characteristics of a totalitarian or police state, but that's exactly what the post office and the government have done in the 21st century in the way they've de dealt with postmasters and their use of the Horizon system. The Horizon system was the biggest non-military IT project in Europe. It cost over a billion pounds to install and affected some 18,000 post offices throughout the UK. To say that's a parliamentary debate. The second quote is from Paul Marshall. The real questions made urgent by the Court of Appeals judgment on the 23rd of April 2021 are nothing to do with why Horizon failed, which is uninteresting and was in prospect a lot, as long ago as 1999. The real questions are, on the one hand, who knew what, when, about its propensity to fail, and on the other, who in the post office, in Fujitsu, and in the post office's owner, the government, were willing to see people imprisoned and denied justice in a ruthless scheme of deception intending to protect the post office brand at almost any cost. A scheme that in a curious fluke of justice has left the brand toxic and possibly valueless. We know that in 2013, the post office received the now notorious Clark advice, which may be discussed later on. We also know that post office head of security had put in place a protocol for shredding inconvenient documents. That should have raised a large, huge flag, but apparently not. What was the direct and awful effect of lawyers and others covering up such crucial evidence for so long? Now, my clients know I'm about to say this next bit. Seema Misra was a postmistress. Seema was prosecuted for theft and false accounting by the post office in 2010. The judge told her she'd stolen from pensioners. She was eight weeks pregnant when she was found guilty and imprisoned. She collapsed on sentencing and had to go to hospital. That same day was her son's 10th birthday. 
She said many times that had she not been pregnant, she would have considered suicide. Tracy Felstead, a sub post office worker. Tracy was tried for theft and false accounting in 2002, age 19. The family paid the 11 and a half thousand pounds she'd allegedly stolen on the understanding this would mean no custodial sentence. Found guilty, Tracy refused to apologize. She was imprisoned. In prison, I had a job there taking hot drinks to the cells. But in this one cell, there was a girl. She was hanging, she was dead. Janet Skinner, sub postmistress. Janet was prosecuted for false accounting in 2006, pleaded guilty on the promise this would avoid a custodial sentence. She was imprisoned anyway. Separated from her two teenage children, she was placed on suicide watch. As Janet said, they were making it as if it must be someone stealing. It was more of a witch hunt than a search for truth. These are real life nightmares, examples of what can happen when concepts, ideas and words and laws, such as ethics, director's duties, governance and disclosure are ignored in this case by a state-owned organization. And when over some 20 years, certain CEOs, directors, senior managers, and professionals, including lawyers, think they can get away with it and that it doesn't matter. But it did, and it does. People got very sick and some died through suicide or otherwise because of that arrogant attitude. So if you take one thing away from my very short talk, may I suggest it's this. The results of people not following the law and legal process are not always merely abstract or academic. It's real. Ask Seema and Tracy and Janet, who are all listening today, as well as hundreds of other victims of the post office scandal. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for your very imp impassioned but uh, pithy speech. Um, can I now call on uh, Flora, 23 Essex Chambers, one of the barristers who's worked on the case, to speak? My quote is from the late, great Clive James. It is only when they go wrong that machines remind you how powerful they are. And I would suggest that that is equally true of humans. The reason this case has been so disastrous for so many people is because the machines which went wrong were in the control of powerful people and they too went wrong. One of the frightening things about the British establishment is that ignorance of machines is rewarded and applauded. For generations, we've been led by people who think their knowledge of classics or literature or history qualifies them for their leadership role. And however essential those who make the machines work are, they will always, they think, remain subordinate. I see this amongst members of my profession, many of whom have been part of the establishment from birth. There's a sort of mock respect for numerate people and technical people oh, it's amazing what they can do, but often a sort of smug satisfaction that goes with saying, oh, I'm a terrible idiot when it comes to computers, you know. There's something not quite top draw about a technical education, which means that those in charge often think that they can leave understanding IT to others. It's clear that this attitude infected the post office board and their lawyers. Evidently, none of them troubled to understand Horizon and happily left all that to the experts. Fujitsu. And it may be that this establishment thinking infected lawyers outside the post office as well. Paul will speak about the way that judges failed to understand how Horizon evidence should have been treated in the first instance trials. I would like to talk about how it affected the criminal lawyers during the criminal appeals. When Paul and I were working on our grounds of appeal, it struck me that there was actually a very simple issue from a criminal practitioner's viewpoint. The one legal issue that is raised repeatedly in every single criminal trial is the burden of proof. It is for the prosecution to prove their case and they must prove it so that the jury are sure of guilt. The famous 1930s case of Wilmington called this the golden thread of English justice. It is raised at the start of every case in the prosecution opening speech the defense closing speech may refer to it many times and the judge will explain it carefully in every single summing up. Nevertheless, the post office had been allowed to come to court and assert that there was a sum of money missing from a set of accounts and then require the defendant to prove that they didn't steal it. They had repeatedly been allowed to reverse the burden of proof. Not only that, they had withheld the error records from Horizon that would enable defendants 
to discharge the burden that had been improperly put upon them. They were forced into a sort of Kafkaesque nightmare. Paul and I put this in our grounds of appeal and ultimately it became the Court of Appeal's chief reason for finding what became known as limb two abuse. That is the prosecutions should never have been brought at all and they were an affront to the public conscience. And yet, we were the only appellate team to raise that point. Eventually, other teams joined in with the limb to abuse argument, but no other team raised the burden of proof issue. This strikingly fundamental point, this legal issue that every criminal barrister hears raised at least three times in every single trial, did not feature in anyone else's grounds of appeal. And yet it became the lead reason for the resounding judgment in favour of limb to abuse. Just in case you're new to the case, I'll briefly explain the distinction between limb one and limb two. The CCRC referred the case to the Court of Appeal on both. The first is quite confined, the first limb. Each of these defendants received an unfair trial, but limb two is much wider. The whole system of prosecuting these defendants was wrong and abusive and they should never have been prosecuted at all. That meant that if limb two succeeded, all the hundreds of people prosecuted by the post office would have good ground to appeal. Now, of course, the post office was not going to admit to this. It conceded the appeals in the majority of cases solely on limb one, and they effectively said that a series of unfortunate events had led to a number of people having an unfair trial. And the other legal teams acting for the other appellants decided that was enough for them. They did not want to argue limb to abuse. Our brave clients decided that they did want to argue it. So Paul, Nick and I became the only legal team that wanted to push the point. There was then a preliminary issue, which the post office contested, of course, on whether the court had jurisdiction to hear the argument, given the concession on limb one. Ultimately, when the Court of Appeal decided that it did have jurisdiction to hear the argument, the other legal teams joined in with the limb two argument. But they did so because they thought that since it was being fought against their better judgment, they thought, they wanted to make sure it was fought well. And yet, none of them, all experienced able criminal lawyers, argued the fundamental point about the burden of proof. This point that became the chief reason for the court finding in favor of Lim Tu. There's a very sad reason actually, for the reluctance to fight Lim Tu. Defence lawyers do not expect the Court of Appeal to be on their side. The experience they repeatedly have of going to the court to ask for justice and coming back with a flea in their ear leads to a justifiably pessimistic attitude. But this case was different. If ever there was a case to make the Court of Appeal move away from its default position, this was it. I spoke to many friends at the criminal bar and they could see it. I wasn't the only one. And ultimately, of course, I don't know why the others involved in the appeal shied away from limb two and didn't argue the burden of proof point. But I do know this, the arguments only became clear once I had got to grips with the IT evidence. It wasn't hard. All the hard work had been done by Mr. Justice Fraser in his brilliant high court rulings. The lesson, it seems to me, that every person in power must learn from him, Mr. Justice Fraser, is this. You cannot avoid the technical issues. If you shy away from them, when the machines go wrong, you will go wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flora, for this. Um, can I now call on Paul uh, to continue with uh, your thoughts as a um, practitioner involved in this case? Thank you, Iris. <clears throat> the Court of Appeals finding against the Post Office of second category abuse of process carries the conclusion that the Post Office's prosecutions subverted the integrity of the criminal justice system. That is a finding against a wholly state-owned enterprise that is of immense significance. It is also apt to be a fig leaf to systemic judicial failure. The post office withheld relevant evidence from those whom it prosecuted on an industrial scale. That is to say, as a matter of course, for over 20 years. 
The post office hijacked the criminal justice system, but the legal system ought not to be susceptible to being hijacked. It is inexcusable that it was. General Christopher Elliott recently wrote a book that might usefully be read by both judges and lawyers. It is entitled High Command. He addresses the distressing question in connection with British military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why did so many senior officers, individuals of high ability, personal integrity and goodwill so disastrously fail? Elliot's question ought to be asked of the judiciary in the post office scandal. The English judiciary is rather less reliable than is commonly thought. Time constraints pre preclude me from elaborating on this. I have elsewhere suggested that were the criminal justice system to be an airline, no one would fly it, such as the incidence of serious failure. On 23rd of April 2021, the Court of Appeal quashed the convictions of 39 appellants who had been convicted on prosecutions brought by the post office since 2001. The 39 appellants' convictions were quashed because they did not receive a fair trial. There are now thought to be as many as 736 possible miscarriages of justice. The number is without precedent. All I can do is now invite you to reflect upon this question. How is it that the courts repeatedly, over 14 years, convicted postmasters on the basis of evidence now known to have been wholly flawed and seriously incomplete? One explanation that has the virtue of simplicity is that judges generally have little idea of how computers fail or what evidence to look for to vouch their reliability. In 1997, Lord Hoffman, a noticeably clever judge, loftily declared that no one needs a degree in electronics to know whether a computer is working or not. The law treats computers like machines, but computers are not machines, or at least they are not only machines. Part of the present problem is that technology advances so rapidly that our means of dealing with it cannot keep pace. There is more regulation in the design of a toaster than there is of someone who writes and sells computer software. The point about computer software errors is that usually these do not cause computers to not work at all, but rather bugs cause them not to work as intended. There is a critical difference. In 2010, Mrs. Seema Misra was a postmaster prosecuted by the post office for an alleged shortfall of £75,000. Prosecuting counsel opened and closed the case against her by telling the jury that were there to have been a problem with the Horizon computer system, any such problem would have been obvious and apparent to a Horizon terminal operator. That's in effect Lord Hoffman's point. The post office Horizon civil litigation incurred costs of around 150 million, it depends on the basis of your estimate, uh, in showing that that's wrong. The Law Commission expressed similar views to Lord Hoffman's in two reports to Parliament in 1993 and 1997. These resulted in safeguards for evidence derived from computers and legal proceedings being removed. The most astonishing aspect of this debacle to anyone technically half literate is that until 2019, the post office failed and refused to disclose to defendants the Fujitsu Horizon Known Error Log. The post office by its leading counsel told Mr. Justice Fraser that the known error log was a red herring. For 20 years, it had, it had succeeded. Mr. Justice Fraser, an engineer by background, was having none of it. He found the thousands of error records that were eventually disclosed by the post office to be fundamental in determining the essential unreliability of Horizon. In case you are not already disconcerted, in 2010, Mrs. Misra, on no less than four separate occasions, had requested that the court order disclosure by the post office of Horizon computer error records. Three different judges dismissed each of Mrs. Misra's applications. In the last application, her defense counsel submitted that she couldn't have a fair trial without further disclosure. The trial judge disagreed and said she could have a fair trial without it. 10 years later, the Criminal Cases Review Commission concluded that Mrs. Misra didn't receive a fair trial. Why? Because she was not given proper disclosure by the post office. This reveals that Mrs. Misra's judge, and by necessary implication, other judges, had no real understanding of the nature of disclosure that may be expected in connection with the performance and reliability of computers. 
Worse, the judge was unable to correctly identify whether or not her trial was fair. That ought to be a matter of serious public concern. In November 2020, at the personal invitation of the Under Secretary of State, I submitted a paper on some of these issues to the Ministry of Justice. It is contributed to or endorsed by eight experts, six of whom are or have been university professors. I understand that it has been referred to the Attorney General and to the Lord Chief Justice. It is now separately published and is publicly available. I'm conscious of time, but I'm going to leave you with a question. It is an important question. You will see that the key is timing. On the 17th of December 2014, there was an adjournment debate in Parliament in Westminster Hall, moved by Mr James Arbuthnot MP. In 2012, in response to pressure from members of Parliament, Second Sight, as you've heard from uh, Ian Henderson, had been appointed by the Post Office to look at its treatment of its postmasters. At the December 2014 debate, the Government Minister for Postal Services, Joe Swinson MP, having heard from MPs a series of shocking stories of the treatment by the post office of its postmasters, said this to Parliament. In such a situation, what I would normally propose doing is to get a team of forensic accountants to go through every scenario and to have the report looked at by someone independent, such as a former Court of Appeal judge. I fail to see how action can be taken without properly looking in detail at every single one of the cases through exactly the kind of scheme that we have set up. We have to look at the details and the facts, and that has to be done forensically. That is why Second Sight, the team of forensic accountants, has been employed, and why we have someone of the calibre of Sir Anthony Hooper, a former judge of the Court of Appeal, to oversee the process. Less than six weeks after the Minister's statement to Parliament, on the 3rd of February 2015, Ian Henderson gave this evidence to the Business Innovation and Skills Parliamentary Select Committee, a clip of which you've just seen a moment ago. Uh, Angela Van, Van Bogard, the po post office's most senior uh, director who gave evidence at the Horizon Issues trial, was, as Ian observed, present at that hearing. Other than parliamentarians, the greatest public debt for uncovering this scandal is, in my view, owed to second sight. They deserve public recognition and commendation for this. What Ian Henderson was this, what Ian Henderson said was this. We have seen no evidence that the post office's own investigations were ever trained or prepared to consider that Horizon was at fault. That was never a factor that was taken into account in any of the investigations by post office that we have looked at. That is a matter of huge concern, and that is why we are determined to get to the bottom of this matter, because we think that there have been prosecutions brought by the post office where there has been an inadequate investigation and inadequate evidence to support some of the charges brought against defendants. This is why we need to see the full prosecution files. When we have looked at the evidence made available to us, I have not been satisfied that there is sufficient evidence to support a charge for theft. You can imagine the consequences that flow from that. That is why we, Second Sight, are determined to get to the bottom of this matter, which we regard as extremely serious. So Ian Henderson in 20, February 2015 told Parliament that Second Sight wanted to do exactly what the government minister in December 2014 told Parliament the government considered was necessary. Within a month of Ian Henderson's evidence to the select committee, in March 2015, the post office summarily terminated the engagement of Second Sight and abruptly withdrew from the mediation process. From then until December 2019, it adopted a policy of denial, concealment and obfuscation. I raise this question for you, given what the Minister had told Parliament on the 17th of December 2014, is it plausible that the Post Office sacked Second Sight in March 2015 without briefing the government that wholly owns the Post Office and pays its bills on the reason for it doing so? In my view, it is inconceivable that it did not do so. Assuming the Post Office did brief the government on those reasons, the Post Office either gave a truthful account of the reason for sacking Second Sight and withdrawing from mediation, or else it gave an incomplete and misleading explanation. If the Post Office gave a truthful explanation, that would arguably make the government complicit in the cover-up of tremendous, unprecedented and widespread injustice. On the other hand, if the Post Office gave a misleading explanation to government, why has there not been the slightest suggestion of this from the government? 
These are very big, important and troubling questions. Was there a cover up? I'm of the view that there almost certainly was. Who was involved remains to be seen. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I would like to express my thanks on behalf of um, the, the audience as well as many of us in the, in, in, you know, as members of the public for your excellent work on this and, uh, and for the three of you for giving your account uh, on what has moved you and, uh, and, and what you have achieved um, so far. There are many, many more unresolved issues and questions going forward. Um, and now we'd like to move on to our commentators on criminal law as well as uh, on uh, corporate culture and governance. So first up would be the criminal law commentators. Uh, can I first invite uh, Anthony Edwards uh, to discuss your thoughts um, about the criminal justice system uh, going forward and the lessons learned from this episode? Iris, thank you. I started my career in criminal law in May 1972 just one week after the murder of Maxwell Confey, a case which identified the first cause of miscarriages of justice, which I've seen through nearly 50 years of criminal practice. That was the maltreatment of the vulnerable during police inquiries and interrogations, and led eventually to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which should have excluded, for instance, any evidence dependent on the lie that any one defendant was the only person making complaints about the accuracy of the Horizon system. In the early 1990s, appeals such as that of Judith Ward, who spent 17 years wrongly in prison, identified that there were major issues about the non-disclosure of relevant material by investigators and prosecutors. That led uh, to the Runciman Royal Commission and in due course to the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act in 1996. That act provides a perfectly workable system of disclosure. If only we could persuade people to operate it properly. We have training, we have guidance, we have Attorney General's guidance, we have judicial protocols. And yet the problem goes on year after year after year. In a very different context, the case of Liam Allen showed the problem in 2018. There is no question in my mind that the failure properly to disclose is the major cause of this extraordinary series of miscarriages of justice. In 2003, appeals such as that of Sally Clark identified a third cause of miscarriage. This was the use of expert witnesses who on further inquiry turned out not to be expert on the subject at all. We tried to deal with it by the criminal procedure rules and by criminal practice directions. And had those been followed and had those been enforced at the outset, it simply would not have been possible for an employee of Fujitsu to sign the Certificate of Independence and their prime responsibility being to the court and not to their client, let alone their employer. And lying behind all that is the, the inevitable, dishonest, corrupt witness, all the worse when they are in the positions of authority, such as police officers or, or investigators. What is so utterly depressing about this series of miscarriages. The largest number that I've seen in 50 years of practice is that every single one of those causes of miscarriage rears its head. In a perfect system, one practitioner or another would spot something that stops it happening. A diligent prosecutor, a dedicated defender, but it was not to be in any of these cases. I can only hope that the Criminal Cases Review Commission is given the significant additional funding that it's going to require to deal with the remaining horizon dependent cases. The delays already are horrific. They must be funded so that we can bring rapidly the remaining cases uh, before uh, the courts. 
I want to concentrate my few comments on the role of the defence lawyers. That is, after all, my speciality. I don't do so to criticise. I do so to identify the problems in the hope that we can reduce these miscarriages of justice. What stood out to me as I read the judgment of the Court of Appeal was the extraordinary fact that nearly 80% of those who are clearly innocent pleaded guilty to an offence with which they were charged. That is an extraordinary factor. I'm afraid it supports research evidence over the years that there is a guilty plea culture in the criminal professions. It's a culture entirely encouraged, I'm afraid, and sometimes forcibly by the judiciary. We need to listen to clients. I keep emphasizing to younger lawyers who I trained over the years that if you're acquitted, there's no question of a discount for guilty plea because you're acquitted by the jury. For there to be an offence of false accounting to which so many people admitted guilt, not only must there be dishonesty, there must be an intent to cause loss to someone, the post office, or gain for themselves. And yet, as I read the judgment of the Court of Appeal, I could find little evidence of any such intent. In a book I've written about the professional conduct of criminal lawyers, I've suggested that when a client wishes lawyer or from the case. To enter a guilty plea poses huge problems. In normal circumstances, it would have prevented any deal taking place, only because the breaches by the post office were so egregious in this case, were those appeals able uh, to be brought and succeed. In my judgment, not guilty pleas should have been more common. There should have been greater proactive work by lawyers for the defence to question the prosecution evidence. I'm not clear how often full disclosure was sought. I accept, of course, that the post office would have lied and hidden it, but were those inquiries made? The Clark advice summarises superbly what is required, anything that may reasonably be considered to undermine the prosecution case or assist the defence. The Court of Appeal in giving its judgment over and over again refers to the lack of audit material in the cases. Where were the known error logs? Where were the evidence of the calls to the helplines? If that material had been available, it would have raised sufficient evidence to rebut the presumption that computers work. People, professors at UCL have suggested that presumption should go. And I hope that the Wynne Williams inquiry will look at that. Linked to all that is, in my view, a lack of expert evidence on the part of the defence at the trial stage. My personal suspicion is that that was caused very much by a lack of funding. The costs were going to be enormous, but there's also a question of quality, oh, that we would have more second sites. Few experts were instructed. In one case, an expert was instructed and a guilty plea was entered. In another, a concession was made that Horizon worked. And I think it was in Seema Misra's case where everything was done, where an expert was called. The Court of Appeal described the expert as not really understanding the issues that underlay the system. The seminar asks for suggestions for improvements in the criminal justice system. I suggest three. Defence lawyers must listen and take on board what their clients say. And when they say they are not guilty, we must work proactively to find the evidence that shows that is the case and to dent the prosecution case. We must do more about expert witnesses. My own view is that state funding should be necessary. That can always be recouped from a guilty defendant, but we need to be able to fund cases such as this. And we, able, we need to be able to find expertise. Finally, I'd suggest that the professional associations need to set up electronic notice boards so that where you have a series of prosecutions, information can be exchanged, experts identified, and the common threads brought out so that acquittals can be achieved. 
In a local area, we did that very successfully with dishonest police officers. All the local solicitors knew who they were and we exchanged the information about them. But these were national cases. And the Bar Association, Criminal Bar Association, Criminal Law Solicitors Association need to look at whether something cannot properly be set up. But I suspect that in these cases, all that would have been in vain because we had prosecutors who did not understand or choose to understand their professional and statutory duties as to disclosure. Whether that is greater that risk in the case of private prosecutions and whether they can be regulated in a better way, I'll now hand over to Jonathan Rogers. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Anthony. And at this juncture, let me just call on Jonathan. I wish I had a few words to add, but uh, Professor Omorod, who is my counterpart in this um, event, is not here today. So I'll hand over to, to Jonathan. Uh, it's very nice to be talking to you, and it's very nice uh, to be at UCL uh, today. I was at UCL for much of my academic career. I don't know whether this counts as me being back at UCL today, but if it is, I'm very glad to be here. Um, before I say anything more, I should... Uh, pay, I think, some, some tributes. First of all, my greatest sympathies to those who are personally affected by the post office prosecutions, um, but of course, my admiration for those who successfully defended them and fought their corner all their way, uh, and most of all, to second sight for enabling um, the miscarriages to be revealed. My own angle on this is from the point of view of private prosecutions. Uh, I co-direct a network called Criminal Law Reform Now, and one of our two projects is on uh, how private prosecutions are regulated and how they should be regulated. It is plain to see that if anybody can start a criminal prosecution, there is always the risk that it will be handled um, undesirably. And that was one reason why we set up the project and made that decision to do so back in 2017. Back then, of course, we had absolutely no idea that the post office um, cases were just around the corner. But that is where we are now. What I'm going to do is just say a few words about what a private prosecutor actually is and safeguards against him abusing his or her powers and why the main safeguard against abuse failed in the case of the post office prosecutions. First of all, then, what does it mean to be a private prosecutor? Well, surprisingly, the term private prosecutor isn't actually found in any statute. Um, and since it's not found in any statute, the words private prosecutor have never actually needed to be defined, and they aren't defined in any particular case. The term private prosecutor then is simply a colloquial term. People might mean private prosecutor as opposed to the Crown Prosecution Service, um, but it's still a colloquial term and not one recognized in legal terminology. In law, we just have prosecutors. And when we put statutory duties on prosecutors, such as duties to disclose evidence, the statute just uses the word prosecutor. It means to refer to the whole lot without any public or private distinction. This lack of distinction then between public and private prosecutor, popular though it is in ordinary speak, uh, is not surprising because that reflects our history in England and Wales. In England and Wales, uh, from the very earliest days, anybody could start a prosecution. Some might think that setting up the Crown Prosecution Service in 1985 was intended to address that, but it was not. The reason why the Crown Prosecution Service was set up by the Prosecution of Offences Act in 1985 uh, was to deal with the problem of the police investigating their own cases and then pursuing them to court often when the evidence was clearly not good enough. The purpose, the main purpose of the CPS then was to make sure that once the police had investigated an offence, um, then a more objective team of state lawyers the newly formed Crown Prosecution Service uh, would take on the job of prosecuting the case effectively and fairly. But that was what it was there for, to take over from the police. It wasn't there to displace anyone else from investigating or prosecuting offences themselves. As far as they were concerned, it was still more or less business as usual. So prosecutors actually come in all shapes and sizes. 
you have the Crown Prosecution Service on one end and you have any individual who might want to prosecute his neighbour for damaging his hedge on the other end. Um, and you can't really distinguish um, sensibly because there are so many uh, different types of people uh, within those two extremes. You have prosecutors who derive their revenue from Parliament. You have some prosecutors who are expected to produce codes of practice. You have some prosecutors, such as the Crown Prosecution Service, who are expected to prosecute if it's in the public interest, rather than it being a choice of theirs. Uh, you have some prosecutors who are subject to routine inspection. You have some prosecutors who are really corporate bodies. You have some prosecutors who are victims of an offence. Yeah, you have some charities. Uh, you have a whole spectrum. All we really need to know for present purposes, then, is that the post office happens to be uh, a corporate body uh, which chose to prosecute. It wasn't required to produce any code whilst doing so. It wasn't subject to any inspection when it chose to do so. Um, and like almost any other prosecutor, it didn't have to ask anyone's permission to start prosecutions. It could just go straight to the magistrate's court ask them to issue a summons against a named defendant for a known offence. The magistrate would almost certainly issue that summons and that prosecutor had direct access to the court system without needing to involve the police, let alone anyone from the Crown Prosecution Service. That, since, it's, since it is pretty much as easy as that then, uh, what are the safeguards against inappropriate prosecutions being brought? Well, there are a few, um, most of them naturally refer to all prosecutors. As I've already said, there isn't really a technical public stroke private prosecutor distinction. In the same way that all prosecutors have duties of disclosure and so forth. Similarly, um, the ability of a court to stop a case for abuse of process applies to all prosecutors, whether it's a prosecution service or anybody else. Similarly, a judge has the ability to stop a trial if it believes the defendant has no case to answer. But there is perhaps one particular safeguard which is uh, worthy of more discussion, um, because at least it does relate to non-Crown Prosecution Service prosecutors. This is the ability of the Director of Public Prosecutions, I'm going to call him or her, the DPP, the DPP is a person who is the head of the Crown Prosecution Service, and by virtue of Section 6, Subsection 2 of the Prosecution of Offences Act 1985, the DPP uh, still had the power he had before the Act to take over any prosecution started by anyone else if he chose to do so, and once he has taken over someone else's prosecution, he may then discontinue it. So that is perhaps the best safeguard of all. If the CPS hasn't actually prosecuted you in the first place, and if someone else is doing so, you can simply go to your local CPS office um, and say, I'm being prosecuted by somebody other than you. Um, can you have a look at uh, the case which they're trying to uh, put forward against me and uh, discontinue it, if you so please? Incidentally, I should make it clear that when I say that, formally speaking, a defendant would be asking the DPP to stop a case brought against him by somebody else, the DPP personally would not make that decision. He would be able to delegate it to Crown Prosecution Service personnel uh, over the country. So it would be likely a decision made in the local area where the prosecution was started. Well, that might not sound too bad then, uh, although the DPP wouldn't be starting these prosecutions or wouldn't be involved in starting them, at least he could in theory step in and discontinue them. And from June 2009, uh, the policy of the DPP was moving in that direction. Uh, in that month of that year, the DPP changed the former policy and the then DPP, Keir Starmer, as he then was, uh, decided that from then onwards, whenever the DPP was asked to take over and discontinue a prosecution brought by somebody else, um, that he would do so if that prosecution did not meet the same standards which would apply um, to any prosecution brought by the CPS itself. In other words, CPS standards would apply when 
continuing whether to discontinue anyone else's prosecution. Both standards are that every prosecution decision must meet two tests, that it must be more likely than not there would be a conviction in court, and secondly, that it would be in the public interest to bring that prosecution. So the policy of 2009 is that where the DPP takes, that, takes the view that a prosecution referred to him does not meet both of those tests, then he would discontinue. Well, this never happened seemingly with any of the post office cases. So now we come to three reasons why this main safeguard did not prove effective. Reason number one, um, in order for the director of public prosecutions to take over a prosecution started by somebody else, he does actually have to know that it has been started by somebody else in the first place, but nobody is under a duty to tell him or her. Not even the magistrate's court, which issues a summons, which puts the prosecution into the system, actually has to tell the local DPP what they have just done. Well, defendants then to a private prosecution are the most likely people to tell the DPP because, of course, they want him to take it over and discontinue it. But they have to know that the possibility of referring the case to the DPP even exists. And it's not obvious to me that defence lawyers routinely advise their clients um, to take this chance. They could do. It's a free shot. You don't have to pay to get the DPP to um, review the case. But it does seem that very few even know of the possibility. Um, and of course, the defendant or the lawyers would have to realise that the post office um, isn't acting with full public authority in the way that the CPS is. I wonder whether some people affected by the post office, and I'd be interested to hear from those who were personally affected, uh, actually found that as well as being spoken to by post office investigators, um, they may also have had some contact with the police, perhaps to arrest them or to um, be present while they were being interviewed. And if that happened, I imagine they rather got the impression that the prosecution was an official job with the police or maybe the CPS somehow involved and it never occurred to them they could just write to the DPP and ask for it to be discontinued. Second reason um, why this safeguard may not work uh, is that the CPS, even when it's a pride of a private prosecution, doesn't really have the power to investigate truly what's going on. It will ask the prosecutor to send the papers over showing what evidence it tends to rely upon, but it won't really be in a position to question that evidence. In particular, the, the DPP would almost certainly not have asked the police to go into the offices of the post office and to do their own survey of the Horizon software. What the DPP tends to do in these situations is to look over the papers and see whether the evidence sounds plausible. But the DPP only really involves the police when the police have started the investigation in the first place. So in a situation such as this, where the police were never involved in investigating, uh, not fully at any rate, uh, then the DPP would not have called in the police either. Um, so in cases where the police have never been involved, the referral system is generally less likely to avail the defendant. Uh, and my last point, on why this system may not have worked too well, uh, is that the DBP doesn't actually see himself as being really responsible for overtaking other people's prosecutions. He has the power to do so, but his main job is to conduct prosecutions where the police have investigated. He's not really there as the uh, last figure who oversees all other prosecutors. If anyone has that role, it's the Attorney General. Uh, the power to take over prosecutions is, was historically only exercised in cases where prosecute, private prosecutors were interfering with a case which the CPS had already started, and he couldn't have two prosecutions running in parallel, so then the DPP would naturally want to discontinue the one that somebody else had started. But it was probably never envisaged uh, that this power to take over would be exercised on a routine basis in respect of potentially thousands of private prosecutions brought every year. Uh, so the safeguard uh, doesn't work and one of many aspects going forward will be to consider what we should be doing instead. I probably overstep my time limit, so thank you for your patience. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for your thoughts. And, and I thank Anthony too. I mean, there are obviously issues in the criminal justice system going, uh, going forward. Uh, we now turn to an issue that's closer to my heart, which is um, 
problems with senior management responsibility, accountability, and corporate culture. And, and I think that this case uh, reveals a lot of these issues that, that many of you are very interested in and which are still unresolved. So can I first call upon uh, Alan, uh, Dr. Alan Brainer of uh, UCL, uh, to provide us with his comments. Uh, thank you, Iris, and uh, uh, thank you for all those people who've been involved in this. Um, I'm going to mention briefly four main aspects, uh, whistleblowing, long-term incentive plans and short-term incentive plans, the bonuses paid to the post office executives, the role of the post office board, and the issues involving cultural change and transparency. All of these points are uh, point to key issues with the culture and ethics uh, at the post office. Turning first to whistleblowing, from my own research and experience, um, in any organization when something has gone wrong, there is always one or more people who knew about it. Um, over some 20 or more years, um, one or more people at the post office must have known about the problems with Horizon. Um, the question is, what whistleblowing uh, processes uh, did the post office have in place? Did any of these concerns uh, reach the board? And if so, what did they do? If concerns raised by staff were intercepted before they got to the board, what steps did the board take to find out what was going on generally? Uh, it is possible that those that got the information declined to hear or delayed acting for a variety of reasons, uh, and that uh, various individuals uh, may have uh, refused to stand up and to be held accountable. It is critical, generally, that unfiltered whistleblowing information is provided to the board unfiltered. The latter should exist on this information getting to them and to take it seriously and to follow it up. It is one of their key roles. The bonus arrangements. The general position is that when executive directors fail for whatever reason, the board should be in a position to claw back bonus payments. Uh, this is confirmed by the UK uh, Corporate Governance Code. When you go and look at the report and accounts of the, the post office over the years, that appears not to have been the position. Uh, if you um, look at um, uh, what was said uh, regarding bonus payments, misstatement of accounts, uh, errors, gross misconduct, yes, that can lead to um, uh, some form of uh, clawback of bonuses. Uh, if you look at uh, the payments paid to the uh, former CEO, the payments seem to have gone ahead without any clawback. It's only when you get to the uh, report and accounts for 2019-20 that the penny seems to have dropped with, uh, with the board. And they've changed the uh, requirements in terms of uh, bonus clawback and that states that the rules have now been strengthened to provide for reductions or clawbacks in bonuses where the executive has contributed to serious reputational damage of the company or material corporate failure or some other exceptional event. You have to go right to uh, 2020 to find these changes. If you look and go on uh, to the next one in terms of the role of the board. Looking again at the report and accounts uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the post office, if you look at the 2016-17 uh, report and accounts, there's no mention at all of the issues uh, with Horizon and sub post office staff. The risk assessment on the same report and accounts has nothing on this issue. Uh, if you look at the board, it was subject to a independent uh, effectiveness review. Uh, apparently, uh, the overall results of the review were positive. If you go to the 
2018-19 uh, uh, report and accounts, uh, it appears that the Horizon scandal was treated as a technical issue. The chairman's statement mentions the litigation as, this is a quote, a disagreement on the management of contractual relationships. And the interim CEO's uh, message says that um, the post office welcomes the criticism. Almost nothing. The final point is to do with culture and ethics and transparency. All of the evidence from the uh, court cases, from everything that we've heard, points to something very, very wrong with the culture and ethics of the post office. This is such a fundamental issue that without major changes, nothing else will work. All will be dust. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Um, we as academics are often unabashed in terms of our criticism of uh, current affairs. Um, I'd like now to invite uh, Dinesh Ramesh, uh, Executive Director of Board Intelligence, to offer her thoughts. Thank you, Dinesh. Thanks, Iris. Um, so first off, to just say um, my kind of heart goes out to all the defendants and so many of them and there's harrowing stories for what they've endured over the last 14 years um, and also huge admiration for um, the defending lawyers to have kind of proven their innocence. Um, the real lives are affected here. And I think what, what's happened, the consequence of all of this is um, a lot of what we see uh, in corporate governance scandals and the, the nub of it is a huge breakdown in trust between institutions and the public. And that's where the post office now finds itself. Um, and, but a more helpful thing I think to think about is what can boards or directors take away from this? What can they do to make sure they don't find themselves in a similar situation? So I'm going to talk about risk, um, stakeholders, and also touching on culture, um, as Alan did. So the first thing um, on risk, boards, most large corporate organizations receive a risk report. In fact, many of them have a, a risk and audit committee where they review information um, which includes various sort of litigation action, but even prior to that horizon scanning of things that are affecting the organization and could affect them either financially or reputationally. So this comes to most boards. Now the problem with the risk report and particularly ones that we see that are very neat and um, quite well self-contained and very well justified is everything a board director needs to know about an organization, its appetite for risk, but also the real risk in the way business is playing out cannot be discerned from a report or information that they are served up from management alone. So the, the one thing I would say for, to board directors is this triangulate. Triangulate from at least three different sources. So yes, the information you receive, but then go out and actually speak to the organization. And the sub postmasters are part of the post office organization, right? So go out and speak to your stakeholders. And the third thing is um, look at, um, he hear and investigate what other people outside the organization are saying about this particular topic. Now, perhaps it's easier today in kind of, 2021 uh, rather than you know back in kind of um, the early 2000s to actually do that because we have the world of social media and this whole event may just have come to light faster but triangulate from more than one source in order to come to your own judgment of what's going on there because you can't be an effective director if you don't challenge the views of management and one of the best things a board director can do is ask the difficult questions and if you don't get a satisfactory answer dig further. Um, because ultimately you are culpable. Um, so that on risk. The next thing is stakeholders. Now, one of them, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a brilliant BBC podcast, which I tuned into on this whole topic. And one of the defendants after coming out of um, um, court said, you know what, we, we weren't listened to. Nobody listened to us. And when I asked, um, were there other sub postmasters who are being affected like I am by this IT system? They lied to us. They said, no, it was just me. 
And so this is, um, I just want to, I'm, I'm no lawyer, by the way, I'm more comfortable in a boardroom than I am in a courtroom, but you'll all know about the 2006 Companies Act and particularly section 172, which talks about boards, board directors making decisions um, in an even handed way in the best interests of all its members and the community and the environment. And its members are very squarely also the sub postmasters in this case. Now, board directors are meant to do a few things when it, when it comes to their stakeholders. They are meant to listen to them, to understand their needs, their interests, their expectations, and their concerns. And here, that just simply did not exist. Now, I know the Companies Act is something that's been quite neglected, and I know it's under revision right now, but if you're a board director out there sitting on a board, stakeholders and engaging with your stakeholder community is will be top of your mind. And it's really come to the fore over the last two years. So pay heed to that and listen um, when you hear voices sort of saying that are aggrieved, um, do listen. And then the third thing is I wanna talk about, just touch on culture because um, there, was a, there was a great sort of question comment made on the chat here, uh, which is, IT systems always go wrong. We know I work for a technology company. They're kind of, it's inevitable, right? So it's not that IT um, systems will ever be kind of completely infallible. There will always be errors. But the thing is when, when IT breaks down or even when things go wrong in business, it's the reaction of leadership that matters most. To consider that actually perhaps you know, this is this is our fault. Yeah. And in the case of Fujitsu working for the post office, it's 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 our fault because we have outsourced this service to a third party. And we, only us, we are responsible for this. We are responsible for the solution as well as the problem. And the role of management and the board in this case to kind of bear that burden of being culpable and accountable for something until you're absolutely satisfied satisfied that you know you've done your very best is just some a way of behaving in a board um, that I think directors um, owe themselves and when it comes to culture in particular a couple of things the information and the information flows to the board are very much orchestrated by management. Now, I don't know the details here uh, and what the board did and didn't know about this and when they were you know, given privilege to various bits of information. Um, but the thing here is you need to go further than the information that you're fed by management. And one board member told me, you know, if it doesn't smell right, probably isn't right, right? And, you know, to sort of act a little on that gut to satisfy yourself that actually the story that you're getting from management is in fact the full story. So um, board directors are working harder for their money now than they ever were um, because of, of things like this. Um, and, I, and I hope there will be a correction in particular around the behaviors in terms of how managements and boards respond to the speed bumps that all businesses hit. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dineshi, for uh, your advice and uh, very useful practical tips uh, for boards and for uh, our corporate stakeholders who might also be here. Um, finally, um, I, I would like to turn to uh, Richard to address um, the elephant in the room, which is the role of in-house lawyers, the role of uh, legal ethics and, uh, and legal professionals in this. There have been many, many questions coming forward about whether uh, boards are unduly affected by defensive in-house counsel and, and, and therefore take certain um, approaches to uh, managing uh, risks and issues that they see. I'm sure Richard will address uh, some of these and give us a good bird's eye overview. So uh, over to you, Richard. Thanks, Iris. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers too and the organisers of the talk working in the background, as well as the audience, um, especially the sub postmasters and others who um, have suffered in ways which is almost impossible for someone like me to imagine. Um, I, I was asked to talk through the lawyers professional misconduct angles, and I will talk through some of the problems there. I should start by saying, uh, as a way of framing, what we see here is probably 
a story of lawyers engaged in the aggressive management of commercial risk and reputational risk, very aggressive management of reputational risk, um, hoping they can manage away problems for the post office that they could not. I should also say I'm just going to concentrate on the post office's lawyers. I'm not going to talk about defence lawyers and I'm not going to talk about all aspects of the problem. Non-disclosure agreements is one interesting bit, which I haven't got time to talk about um, now. Uh, the first problem, uh, quite a prosaic one in some ways, the design and execution of the sub-postmaster contracts and the enforcement of supposed debts under those contracts was, in the words of Mr Justice Fraser, oppressive. Um, and just to give one example, overstating contractual obligations when threatening litigation is, in my view, very capable of being professional mis being found to be professional misconduct by the solicitor's disciplinary tribunal. So the, the particular problem is solicitors cannot take unfair advantage of opponents, whether unrepresented or represented. And in, in many ways, quite a lot of what we see in, in this case is that very thing, unfair advantage being taken by the post office and perhaps by the lawyers involved. The second problem I would say is uh, the post office's conduct of the Bates litigation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mr Justice Fraser criticised the post office for maximising expense and difficulty, for disparaging claimants individually and collectively in ways unsupported by the evidence, and in particular for unsatisfactory and sometimes misleading evidence. And if the lawyers attempted to say, well, that's just the client's not coming up to proof, the judge says the team assisting one witness, it was um, Angela van der Bogard, either helped produce one-sided evidence or were unaware of all the documents replied upon by the relied upon, sorry, by the claimants. And to me, what he's saying there effectively is this might either indicate unprofessional conduct or it indicates incompetence. So take your uh, take your pick, I suppose. Um, more generally, the SRA may well see the tactics as abusing the litigation process, and they have emph emphasized in their guidance on balancing duties during litigation that this can attract serious consequences. So I would expect that particular aspect of the case to be quite heavily investigated. The, prob the third problem is an interesting one, the recusal application, I got mentioned earlier by Ian, I think, made by Lord Grabener mid one of the big trials, I, I forget which one it was. Uh, there's a professional ethics question about whether it was properly arguable, even was it perhaps an abuse. Uh, now, Lord Justice Coulson, in rejecting the recusal leave for appeal application, seemed to entertain the idea that it was a purely tactical endeavour, and his dismissal of the recusal is uh, extraordinary in some of the language he uses, and that to me suggests real concern about the application and sometimes Lord Grabner's tactics. Now, I have to say, I'd expect the BSB to duck this one for various reasons, but lawyers cannot lay the blame for strategy all at the client's feet. Uh, the case of Faruqi, for instance, says lawyers are responsible for strategy. They cannot simply say they were acting on instruction. So Lord Grabner here can't just say, well, I was instructed to take this case and I took the case. There is more responsibility than that at play here. Um, if you stand back from the Bates decision, and it's massive, if you read the, both of the really big judgments, it suggests an organisation and, I'm afraid to say, a legal team probably straying beyond their best case towards at least presenting a misleading uh, picture. That's certainly the tenor of um, some of Fraser's language. His judgments are helpful, but we do need to know more before forming a final judgment. Is what has been referred to elsewhere as polishing evidence going on here, for instance? Fraser appears worried in particular about a kind of party line having been cultivated amongst certain of the witnesses. Now, those of you who followed the case will know the post office's flat earth case, if you like, was that the horizon system worked perfectly well and you've heard that it did not and some of the reasons why it did not. And indeed, Fraser found lots of bugs over a number of years, known behind the scenes in the post office that there were difficulties with the horizon system. And the interesting question is, who did know? And I'll come back to that. And um, the question for the lawyers is, of course, the extent to which any arguments they advanced were in inconsistent with what they knew uh, or, what the knowledge they had or ought to have had, and also whether they responded honestly and competently to red flags raised around the issues. They can't simply turn a blind eye to problems. Sometimes they have to investigate. Now that takes us towards the criminal cases. We're told there were failures to investigate reasonable lines of inquiry. Uh, 
Uh, the prosecutions were run, uh, we heard from Ian, absent evidence of dishonesty. There were failures to disclose problems with Horizon, not to mention using experts who it turned out were not even proper experts. Now, putting to one side the CPS code, a lawyer is obliged to behave with integrity and to protect the rule of law and administration of justice. This, coupled with the obligations under law on disclosure, suggests the handle, handling of these cases merit very full scrutiny by the SRA and the Bar Standards Board for those involved. This should include whether a criminal prosecution was allied to debt recovery, compromising the lawyer's independence, for instance, as the one case that Ian uh, wrote to uh, Biz about in detail uh, seems to show. Again, you've heard a bit about the Clark advice. What happened after the Clark advice? That's a really interesting question. We don't know a great deal about it. Uh, the Clark advice, uh, uh, just as a reminder, exposed an expert who could not qualify as an expert, had utterly discredited himself as an expert in Clark's view, and had into the bargain misled a court on more than one occasion by failing to disclose relevant errors in the Horizon system. It's kind of the opposite of whatever a star witness is. Um, now, Clark said this needed to be disclosed to affected sub postmasters. And you might think, and I would agree, that this, coupled with the discovery, as we heard earlier, that the director of security was trying to get minutes shredded, was enough to pollute the entire process that everybody should be, who affected should have been told. It, it certainly gives it an a rise to an avenue for defense or appeal for uh, a very large slice, I would think, of the sub postmasters and is likely relevant to the civil claim in Bates, but none of those facts were disclosed. Um, these disclosures, which were so devastating in the Court of Appeal, were managed back, to, managed, managed back by the lawyers and the post office, it looks to me like anyway, to limit the damage they caused. It seems, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of this at the moment, relatively few disclosures were made. On what basis was that decision taken to manage it back? We don't know. Now, if I understand it correctly, Mr. Clark himself uh, and Mr. Altman QC, who led the appeal hearings for the post office, may have been involved in this. Uh, and this part of the story in particular, I think, needs full scrutiny. I have to say, I find it very interesting indeed that Mr. Altman could continue to have conducted the Ham Hamilton appeals given this history. He was uh, instructed around the time of the Clark advice by the post office or shortly afterwards, uh, as I understand it. Um, the disclosure decisions were central uh, to the handling of the case and to the appeals. He had what looks like a significant role in advising on that in anticipation or at the time of the CCRRC investigation beginning. Uh, those failures to disclose were absolutely central to the findings against the post office in the appeal. The question has to be asked, did he have a conflict of interest, potential or actual, uh, in, in relation to the case uh, at the point that the appeal was actually heard? Or is this just one of the things that, you know, not typically happens to prosecutors on cases they're instructed in? I don't know the honest answer to that question, but I have quite concerns about it. Um, those questions multiply when one looks at what we appear to know about how the Clark advice came out and the very odd, if I may say so, half raising of contempt or possible contempt, which had the effect of uh, neutering Paul and Flora's representation before the Court of Appeal. Now, there may be a very innocent explanation here, but in the light of a potential conflict, those kinds of applications being made or half made, I think that raises quite a lot of concerns and would be another example, if you like, of why it would have at the least been better for Mr. Altman to step back from the appeal on at least on the way that it, it looks at the moment. A point of some interest to the kind of broader points that Alan, uh, uh, for instance, was making, the broader question of the post office cover up is what happened, or if it was a cover up, is what happened around the Clark advice and the shredding inc incident. Now, we do know that the general counsel at the time knew about it. Uh, now, under her professional rules, this information should have been conveyed to the client's material information. The client needs to know about it. And I would say, I'd argue quite strongly in this case, given the nature of the information, that means the board and especially the non-executive directors. Uh, the GC, we know, left the company shortly after this point in time. Uh, it, so it may be that she let, told the board and resigned, saying that she had enough, couldn't carry on working with them on this case, or she may have been asked to go, we just don't know. Um, um, uh, 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 but if she did tell them, uh, and my instinct is that she probably did, uh, what do we make of the post office conduct after that knowledge was disclosed? It, a really important question. 
Uh, and that question raises for me a really acute, in acute form, the accountability gap. The then CEO, Paula Venels, has issued a statement, uh, I think uh, uh, six months or so ago, plainly trying to shift blame onto the lawyers for the conduct of the cases. And the lawyers will seek to argue, I expect, that they were simply acting on instructions. Now, the truth is more likely in the territory that there was quite a strong degree of joint working here, that both the lawyers and execs were engaged in an aggressive strategy of initially promoting and supporting Horizon through the contracting scheme and so on for its commercial benefits, and latterly trying to protect its reputational Achilles heel. It's vital, I think, that the Williams Inquiry and the professional regulators investigate this properly to ensure that one group does not pass the buck off to the other and that, for instance, legal professional privilege does not frustrate a proper investigation here. I did want to end by saying uh, a couple of general things. Um, it will be small comfort to the sub postmasters and others whose lives have been ruined by the behaviour of the post office and the legal assistance of that behaviour. But what I do want them to know is that this case it's exemplary reporting by Nick Wallace, Carl Flinners and others, and the extraordinary judgments of Mr. Justice Fraser, Lord Justice Coulson and the Court of Appeal, as well as the sterling work by the lawyers, Flora, Paul and other, uh, uh, and Nick, have led us to what might be, and I emphasize the word might here, might be a turning point for lawyers' ethics. Certainly, I have not seen, and um, I've seen the attendance list here, uh, there are, I have not seen such a strong and concerned reaction from lawyers keen to learn the lessons of this terrible case. Hopefully, profound change can come. I hope that the regulators will investigate, do so with alacrity, and prosecute if that is the decision in these cases fairly but fearlessly. Um, but I think the case indicates broader problems too. I think the SRA needs to think again about the absence of a government regime around in-house practice. There needs to be, I think, also a thematic review around litigation culture. The Bates comments are extreme, but they're not completely atypical of the sorts of things we see quite often in commercial cases where the judges sometimes tear their hair out at the behaviour of the lawyers involved. And I think more profoundly and difficultly, we need to think about, think very carefully about and act on the extreme inequalities and biases that play out in the justice system. We had Tony talking about some of that, for instance, and Flora, uh, in the civil and criminal system, because what this case shows us is how uh, those problems extend, not just from the criminal justice system, although obviously it was more serious there, but also in things as mundane as the power of contract and the way the lawyers structured those uh, deals with the sub postmasters. And I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for your thoughts. Um, we've, we've had um, a wonderful distinguished panel that has given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I, I do realize that we are running slightly late, but uh, we have many, many questions uh, from the audience as well as many questions that were fielded at the pre-event. And I hope that um, all of us might be willing to stay 15 minutes or so uh, in order for some of these remaining questions to be asked uh, and for panelists to uh, give the final comments on these. Um, in, in terms of uh, looking at themes that people are interested in, I think I, I, have, I have decided that we're, we're going to select about three themes uh, for panelists to address. And the first one is um, technological reliance uh, and, and how professionals, lawyers, um, even you know, internal auditors, risk management might rely on these things uh, and, and senior management as well. Um, and how do we overcome some of the weaknesses and the flaws and the deficits uh, in terms of uh, expert professional you know, reliance on technology? And how do we not allow you know, such reliance to, to result in uh, failures in our judgment, causing um, failures and harms to other people's lives? Um, I'm just wondering whether I could get a, um, a, a selection of panelists to, co to, to comment on this, um, probably first Ian, uh, and then hopefully Dineshi uh, and um, perhaps uh, one of the practitioners who worked on the case, Flora. Yes, great. Right, thank you very much. Um, computers fail, as I'm sure most of us are, are well aware. Um, what seems to have been sort of lacking in this case is an awareness uh, of what I call professional scepticism. Um, it was clearly wrong that Horizon, you know, was perfect. And, and that was the position adopted by post office, certainly when Second Sight first had contact with them. And it was only when I met Gareth Jenkins, the lead engineer for Fujitsu, 
that who went on the record very early on in our inquiry and said, yeah, of course we've got bugs, errors and sort of defects. We've got a whole team of people constantly sort of tweaking the system, um, trying to d deal with all of that. Now, that was at variance with what we were being told by, by, by post office. So, yes, computers do fail. However, it would be wrong um, for anybody to think that having a you know, a, a computerism with a lack of robustness was necessarily a get out of jail card. And that's one of my concerns about this, this case sort of going forward. Yes, Horizon was a, you know, a pretty awful system, but actually the real problem was not just um, a, a computer system that lacked robustness. It was the way that sort of post office reacted sort of to it. So I think one of the thoughts I'd like to sort of leave with, with everybody is, understand your technology a point very eloquently made by by Flora in in her sort of presentation you know it is no longer acceptable to say well that's a computer i don't really understand it you know oh dearie me um we are living in a technological world understand the the limitations of the the technology that that is part of that that world and understand what works what doesn't work and know what to sort of look out for. With hindsight, it was obvious that there were problems with Heinz, with, with Horizon. But sadly, nobody or very few people in, in post office were sufficiently engaged to, to address that. I respect to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Dinesh, please. Um, so the, the, the thing about technology is we're going to, we are ever more reliant on it, right? So this is a problem that's not going to go away. Um, and I, I, I think the, and, and it always goes wrong. And sometimes we only notice when it, when it properly breaks and we, you can't get into it or it, it, it throws something up. Um, but so often there are many, many errors that go overlooked. Um, and I think the thing that's most instructive here um, that the post office didn't do until Second Sight came on to um, the scene was to have these very important systems from time to time audited by third parties, not the people who built it, but people from, you know, who, who are professionals in this. And to do that as a matter of course, especially where it involves financial payments. Um, and this is, so, so that's the very first thing. Don't take your own sort of developer's word as, as good um, that, you know, this, it's all working fine, um, isn't it? Um, and then I think the second thing is, it's, it's an interesting point that people make around kind of educating leadership teams, boards on technology issues. Um, so we see we see a couple of things in this scenario situation. Technology is moving at such pace that it's actually quite hard if you are not an engineer or somebody who's involved in coding to actually keep pace with the implications of some of the changes that are happening technology wise. Right. So it's not that, um, you know, for example, we have coded this piece of software um, and its main persona is going to be a, a kind of male of this per particular demographic. And that might be what it was built for, but roll forward 10 years, the way it will be used might be completely different. And the implications of some of this development are just very far reaching. So what, what can you do? So I think there is an extent to which, um, unless you are a technical expert, you just cannot keep up with this, right? So the thing here is to sit back and ask very sensible, quite common sense, quite basic questions. So tell me, how does this actually work? And what we find in um, boards, in particular, board directors, you know, the good ones, they do one of two, they do one thing in particular. Um, and, one, and one director said, you know, I look into the whites of their eyes of the person who's presenting to me, and I get a sense of whether this person is credible, whether this ex supposed expert on this topic really knows their stuff. Now, and then I make a judgment. Now, there's a whole bunch of kind of issue around, you know, making subjective judgments there, but there is something about um, kind of testing for credibility 
and actually asking the right questions. And even if you're not a technical expert, an expert, you can do those things, right? You can test for credibility and you can ask difficult, sometimes obvious questions and see how unstuck someone becomes. Um, so I think that that um, directors, you know, um, aside from the education that a lot of them get now and what we find in boards is boards invite experts to kind of educate their boards on cyber digital whatever it happens to be but it's or I would say it's not enough because you cannot simply keep pace so then you're looking for directors who exercise judgment and provide sufficient challenge um, around how businesses operate Thank you. Thank you, Dineshi. Um, over to Flora. So just to talk about it from the lawyer's side, and uh, I noticed that one of the questions was about whether legal training should incorporate some sort of um, technological training. Uh, I, I, I take Dineshi's point that actually having specific technological training at the point when you're training to be a lawyer is probably going to become out of date very quickly. Um, but what it would do or at least building something into legal training would be to emphasize to lawyers how absolutely crucial it is. And it may be that it needs to be something a little bit broader rather than um, IT training as such, a little bit of basic numeracy, because this kind of goes into other things as well. It's not just to do with IT. And we've heard the case of Sally Clark mentioned, I think Tony mentioned it earlier on. That's another example where lawyers just failed to spot really, really important um, technical issues. And, and it was about numeracy. And I think it's that, that, that sort of issue that I think is why uh, somebody else's question was, you know, did nobody until the appeals notice the burden of proof point? No, they didn't. And I think, again, it's because lawyers don't spot the, the, the fact that they need to get to grips with a technical or numeracy issue. And so when somebody presents that evidence to them, says here's something from a computer or here's a science um, based piece of evidence here's something from a, a scientific expert they just take it they just take it as read and they don't use their critical analysis in the way that they would if it was some other piece of evidence so i think it's about i think if there is something to be built into the training for lawyers it would be about trying to drum home this idea that you must treat technical evidence just with the same critical attitude that you would treat any other kind of evidence. Iris, can I can I jump in there? Am oh, I yeah. sure. to add a comment? I, I think one of the things that one has to remember in this entire saga is that if you go back to 1999, Horizon was a failed public procurement project by the government. It was recognized in 1999 uh, to be uh, uh, un insufficiently tested. At a select committee meeting, uh, select committee, parliamentary select committee of what was then BIS in 1999, Alistair Darling and other government ministers told the, the government that this project, if it continued with it, which was supposed to run the benefits system uh, in conjunction with the post office and the benefits agency, uh, presented the government with a prospect of catastrophe. That's a quote. And um, it was taken over by the post office uh, from Fujitsu, who'd acquired it, knowing that it was a flawed system. Uh, in my view, one of the most serious vices in this entire story is that the post office, recognising that it had a system that was uh, potentially flawed, uh, sought to transfer the commercial risk associated with uh, the failure of the Horizon system to postmasters. It did this by a very simple mechanism, and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up quite soon. The uh, contract, which was a very elaborate and extensive contract, provided that in the event of uh, any shortfall uh, at a Horizon terminal, it was the postmaster's uh, obligation to make up that shortfall. Worse, the statement of a, uh, a postmaster's balance at their Horizon terminal uh, was treated under the contract as an account. Now, lawyers who are listening to this will know that an account is tantamount to acknowledgement of a debt due. The consequence of that is it put the burden on the postmaster to show why the balance was wrong if they wanted to challenge it. Lee Castleton 
was subject to a civil claim in 2006. Uh, he couldn't afford representation at his six day trial. And at the outset, he was invited to accept, and he did accept that the balance that he had stated, which was a loss of 26,000 uh, pounds, was an account in law. It was down to him to prove that was wrong. That would require him to show that Horizon had uh, operated unreliably, performed unreliably. He could not do so. The judge concluded that the Horizon was working perfectly. He had an adverse costs order made on that judgment of 321,000 pounds made against him. That made him bankrupt. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is known that the post office after that showed that judgment to others. It's a reported high court judgment and almost everything in it is wrong, both factually and legally. Uh, the post office showed that to other postmasters to deter them from challenging the post or, uh, the, the, the uh, reliability of the horizon system and the post office's claim for the uh, missing shortfall. Um, uh, in, in, in my view, uh, that is utterly deplorable. And from the outset, the post office knew that it was transferring the commercial risk to its postmasters. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for, for your thoughts. Um, th this is obviously a very, very difficult issue and one that uh, we'll continue to, to grapple with um, in terms of uh, technological reliance, reliability, and uh, how we relate uh, to technology. Um, moving on to um, the next big um, theme that um, I think most of us were concerned about is what, what is the future for the wrongly prosecuted victims? Um, where is compensation coming from? Is the government taking responsibility? Is the post office taking responsibility? And how will this end in basically a round of justice for, for uh, all who are affected? So I'm wondering who might like to respond to this question. Um, Possibly Nick, Alan, and Tony. Could we have uh, you in this order? Um, right. Well, I I will respond very quickly by saying that I will definitely bow to Paul on this. I think it's it's uh, it's well known. I think the post office is broke, so um, it doesn't really have the money, as far as I understand, to pay very much except its legal fees, um, and it's going to have to look to the government, and the government is going to have to sort it out. Um, there is a, I think I've read somewhere that the government is hoping to offload the post office in the not too distant future. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not sure um, that you can offload a company even to um, rather naive investors when it's got a potential liability of between quarter and half a billion pounds. So I suspect the government, if they want to do anything like that, will have to make it good and quickly. And I think the other thing that, that I'd like to say is that what we don't want is years and years of complex compensation processes like we've seen in Lloyd's H. Boss and other such um, examples where it just gets bogged down in complete legalities uh, and it just and the money again goes to the, the you know the, the the poor old legal profession and the victims the clients the appellants whatever always seem to lose out so that that's my view. Shall, shall I le leap into uh... yeah join in on that since you more or less invited me to do so. Um, I, I think it's perfectly clear that the post office can't meet the existing horizon shortfall scheme. Uh, there are over 2,400 new applicants to that scheme or applicants to that scheme. Uh, and the post office has said that it can't pay that compensation. So as a result of what's happened, the post office is at least formally insolvent. The government has said it's going to support the post office in, in uh, those claims. Uh, more broadly, I think it's almost certain, and this is just my intuition, it is almost certain that the government, the post office and the, uh, the Treasury, of course, are uh, likely to try and put together some kind of proposals uh, for bringing this all to a close so far as the post office is concerned, because otherwise it is now faced, that is the post office, um, uh, which is which is of course owned indirectly by the or owned directly by the government through UK government uh, investments is going to be subject to multiple claims, including prospective claims for malicious prosecution, uh, most of which on the face and uh, on the face of it pretty viable uh, for years to come, um, and that is going to be um, highly damaging and commercially 
uh, very difficult to handle. So I think something is going to be put together and the government will probably uh, uh, try to make proposals for, for broad uh, claim uh, uh, um, uh, compensation uh, payments to, to all those affected. And, and one has to hope that we're not going to see the same kind of rigmarole that has, um, in, uh, has, has infected uh, the Lloyds Bank Reading Compensation Scheme, which has now been going on for years and years and has, is now in its second uh, iteration under Mr. Justice uh, Foskett, Sir David Foskett, as he now is retired. Um, the other thing that I think is, and, and, and I'll be very brief on this, the other thing that I think is, is, is the, um, at the moment, the unaddressed uh, issue is um, uh, Fujitsu's role in all of this. And um, Mr. Justice Fraser referred two of the Fujitsu witnesses, including Mr. Jenkins, um, one of the architects of the Horizon uh, system, uh, to the Director of Public Pros Prosecutions. And there's now a, a police investigation uh, going on in relation to him, uh, which I um, sought to assist by providing the investigating officer with the copy of the clerk advice, which um, uh, neither the post office nor um, the Court of Appeal uh, thought was a, a good thing. Um, but um, uh, the, the, uh, there is a real prospect, in my view, of uh, Fujitsu being drawn into all of this uh, because um, it operated the system, it provided it to the post office. And one of the things we know is that from the outset, Fujitsu was operating remote access to uh, branch horizon terminals, uh, which um, A, it kept no records of either the access itself or what it did in exercising those access rights. Uh, and furthermore, right up until 2019, this was denied by the post office um, uh, throughout the period, including in particular when it was raised in 2015 uh, by, sorry, 2013 by uh, Second Sight. Um, the post office publicly denied that it was possible. Now, you don't need great uh, insights to recognize that the remote access of financial accounts by a third party uh, prospectively uh, uh, um, renders the integrity of those accounts uh, questionable. Uh, I think it's at least arguable that in every single prosecution, had that issue uh, been raised and pursued, and obviously known to the defence, um, it would have uh, uh, stopped all the prosecutions in their tracks. One of the most astonishing things, well, there are a lot of astonishing things, but <laughs> one of the most astonishing things is that uh, the uh, remote access facility exercised by Fujitsu and known of by the post office um, uh, attracts and merits only, I think, one sentence in the Court of Appeals judgment. Anyway, I'll shut up. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, just wondering if Anthony wishes to add anything uh, on the compensation. Uh, well, only, only very briefly, the, the, the criminal courts really don't have a suitable remedy to deal with this, even if someone is prosecuted, it's not going to represent a way forward for so many people who've been abused. Uh, it'll be civil proceedings, if anything, and we've already had the most extraordinary delays, and they will never be fast. So I do hope that the government will come up with a scheme uh, to avoid what I think inevitably would be successful proceedings. Um, I think it's then for the post office in Fujitsu to sort out um, who pays what portion of, the, of that bill. Right, thank you. Um, Alan, would you like to add anything on uh, government accountability and responsibility? Um, the answer is no. Um, the, uh, but I would like to say just one thing, uh, reinforcing what Flora was saying, that um, uh, uh, it is absolutely incumbent on lawyers uh, and boards to be completely au fait with uh, both the IT systems that uh, they are um, commenting on, and also to be uh, numerate and be able to understand financial statements. I don't know how board directors and their advisors can do their jobs without that, and the same applies to uh, lawyers involved. 
Uh, the only other point is just to say that uh, uh, under the Companies Act, um, the directors, the non-exec directors, um, have the ability to uh, uh, employ, engage themselves um, experts to report to them directly um, above and beyond that available to the executive. Uh, and uh, this is a key facility. The other element is that uh, the non-exec directors have also got a tool in terms of the internal audit function which is uh, very powerful, potentially very powerful, um, which is at their call um, to bring information and expertise to bear on any case, their own investigators, they should use them. Thank you, thank you, Alan. Um, I think I'll, I'll reserve um, the final question for Richard. And I think this is also a question that's been raised by uh, several uh, members of our audience which is the, the role of general counsel and how blinkered that they can get. I mean, can you really rely on internal gatekeepers within the corporation itself to bring light to wrong uh, and, to, and to correct behavior on the part of, of, of management? And, and what do you think um, of um, general counsel's roles going forward? So, um... It's quite a complicated question. The, the, at one level, it feels obviously right that there's a problem with general counsel when you see a case like this. But we have to remember there were quite a lot of external counsel and lawyers involved in this case, helping um, the post office strategy in very significant ways. I talked about some of those. So I don't think this is purely solely or mainly about whether general counsel are more or less independent than um, outside counsel. I think both both roles can give rise to problems of lack, lack of independence, a desire to please the client in ways which they perhaps shouldn't pr proneness to certain kinds of bias, which mean their deci decisions aren't very independent and so on. Uh, at, we may have seen, and I say only may, we may have seen a general counsel standing up to the company at one stage in this case. That's one possible in interpretation of the uh, events I again discussed in my brief segment. But I do think we do, what's really important, I think, is the, both the, independent, the, the, the independence of the general counsel, but also the culture within the organisation and the relationship between the general counsel and the board, particularly the general counsel and the non-execs, and the general counsel and the non-execs relationship, to pick up a bit on Dinesh's point, and people outside of the executive and non-executive board teams. Um, because those kinds of relationships are absolutely crucial. I do think there's a, there's a really interesting question about how the chairman stays in post, given what was going on on his watch, for instance, in this particular um, uh, a case. But it, there's a whole bunch of things around, uh, around independence, what might, what, what, what might drive that forward. I do think there is, this is one of the things that needs a really good hard look is, what are actually the requirements on general counsel when dealing with issues like this? What are their reporting requirements? Maybe they need spelling out more clearly. Um, uh, when a general counsel leaves, we, it might have happened in this case, did the, did the chairman of the board interview Susan Crichton when she left, for instance, to find out why she went? Uh, was, there, was there access, free flowing access between non-execs, particularly the chair and the general counsel? those kinds of issues might all help to make a difference. I think there's a really interesting question about accountability around legal strategy here. Uh, so there's been a quite vigorous debate, um, partly sponsored by people like Alan and myself, around senior management regimes in the financial sector and whether legal risk needs more properly uh, dealing with under that scheme and particularly the management of the legal function. I think that needs, this case shows very clearly why that sort of thing needs thinking about. Uh, there was a very aggressive strategy around litigation, around contractual management, uh, and uh, dealing with the appeals, which suggests that there were significant problems that somebody needs to be held accountable for that. And if that's not the general counsel, then it's the board or a member of the board, but we need to be clear about who that is, actually. It's not clear at the minute. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I think we, we have come to uh, the end of our, our, our time uh, for this event. And um, we, we very much appreciate the panel for giving us this time and for staying 120 minutes uh, to um, address all of these issues and to answer our audience's um, questions. I'm afraid that there are many um, questions that, that really cannot be precisely uh, um, addressed and, and answered at, at the moment. 
um, comments such as whether or not the CB given to polar venals, um, whether something ought to be done about that, and, and the, the medal that the, the Law Society awarded the post office in 2018. I mean, these are some comments made by um, our stakeholders, and I know they remain outstanding concerns. Um, so it remains for me to thank the panel uh, for all of you to have been here today and, and for all of you to have shared your thoughts and, and given us uh, your views. Um, many of these will continue to remain important for uh, research and projects as well as um, the development of opinions going ahead. Um, and thank you to, to the audience who have uh, signed up. This is probably one of our best attended events um, in the entire calendar year. Uh, for obvious reasons, this is such an important issue uh, for, for many, many aspects of the legal system uh, and for society in general. And we sincerely hope that uh, going forward, there will be um, actions taken to resolve these issues of justice. So uh, thank you all uh, for being here. And uh, this um, event is recorded and will be made available on YouTube uh, in due course. So thank you again and um, good evening. And hopefully uh, all of you will have a great week.